Business Matters is brought to you in part by Lionberger Construction. Hello and welcome to Business Matters, a program on Blue Ridge PBS that strives to explore that subject from a variety of viewpoints and scenarios, featuring interviews with the people helping to grow jobs, the economy, and the Blue Ridge region, because business matters. I'm Gene Morano. Our special guest is Lance Jones, Market President for the Lewis Gale Regional Health System, part of the HCA Healthcare Organization. We'll talk about expansion and new technology at Lewis Gale and how the local HCA Healthcare affiliates have been weathering the COVID storm. And Lance, thanks for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Glad to be here. Thank yeah. you. I know you've got a busy schedule like everyone else. Um, let's, let's get through the COVID thing first. How, has, how are things going? Um, I, I, we've done stories with the ER people recently about how taxed they are, but what's the current status and how's the staff handling the yeah. COVID surge? Listen, I will tell you to a testament to the medical providers and staff across the entire Valley, Gene. This is obviously a, a challenge for all healthcare, not only in our market, but across the country and frankly around the world. Um, in terms of what we are currently seeing, we are starting to see a decline in some numbers when we look at the incidence rate, which is certainly positive. Uh, the challenges, I think, continue to be, frankly, in terms of our continued management and the ongoing awareness in regards to prevention. Mm -hmm. And the discussions around vaccination, the prevention measures that everybody needs to deploy frequently will continue to be for, certainly front and center of, of many discussions, likely for many years. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, uh, Lance, what have you been doing, what has Lewis Gale been doing for the medical staff at all the facilities you operate? As far as mental health issues, you know, when these, when these healthcare workers, the frontline workers are over, overtaxed, what is Lewis Gale doing for those guys? Yeah, the, the behavioral health um, arena has certainly accelerated and, and that aspect has been heightened again across the country. So specifically, our company HCA has a very strong employee assistance program and the behavioral health resources in that arena have doubled during this time. So the complement of psychology, psychiatry, social worker support, be it in a virtual capacity or face-to-face, -face, uh, has definitely been something available for our teams. Where we've needed one-on-one -on -one or local department discussions within our facility, we've certainly helped facilitate that as well. And we're very fortunate to actually have a behavioral health team that reside at the Lewis Gale campus, not only here in Salem, our Pulaski and Allegheny markets also. So yeah, so talk about the market, the region that you oversee. It's, it's Salem? Yeah, Montgomery, Blacksburg, uh, Pulaski, and then Allegheny. So in, in total, we have 2,500 associates that are part of our team and approximately 800 physicians that are on staff providing care. Um, any advice for people who any advice for people who are not vaccinated at this point? Uh, uh, you've, everyone has heard the message. Um, unless there is a, certainly a medical or a personal reason uh, spiritually that you may choose to decline, then do everything you can to protect each and all of us. Mm -hmm. And I know that one thing on the thing is that, and this is true for Lewis Gale, for Carillion, whatever, but keeping people away from emergency departments at hospitals, unless it's a real emergency. Correct. That's, that, that's, an, that's a big thing. It's a really important thing. The, the ER is not fundamentally a COVID testing site, for example. And we've certainly seen that with this most recent surge with Delta, um, where folks thought, well, I just need to be tested and I'll go to the emergency room. At the same time, you parallel that someone's having a heart attack, someone's having a stroke, someone's in there for a truly emergent need, and resources get diluted. So we've tried, and, and I think again, across the valley, we've done a, a nice job uh, collaboratively with Carillion to make sure that folks are aware. If you do not have a true emergency that you define it as, mm -hmm. then please, if you can access your local physician or urgent care, we'd encourage you to do that. Now, Lewis Gale has a standalone ER, and you're building another one. That's correct. So across our market, we currently have five emergency rooms between all of our facilities. Our freestanding emergency room located in Cave Spring on, on Electric Road in the process of constructing another one, um, and that'll be on Highway 460. We head out in the Blue Hills corridor, mm -hmm. obviously 460 expanding rapidly, um, but for that community, that region, and when you extend a little north to 81 or up to Botetot, uh, certainly a chance to provide for those communities a little more closer access to emergency room care. How's the one in Cave Spring been working, Lance, as far as is it taking stress off the ER? 
at Lewis Gale. It certainly has. We've seen patients that may have historically traveled to the main campus and they reside in that part of the county, access that market, uh, access that facility. Um, so it's proven to be a, a good location for folks and certainly convenient. All right, well, let's get this out of the way. Yeah. Uh, you're obviously not from here. So <laughs> tell people where you're from and, and how you got to the States. I think you came to the States for graduate work from? I did, from New Zealand. is home for me and, and came to the States now 27 years ago. Came as a physical therapist. And that's how I arrived here and, and was recruited from New Zealand to Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, so that, that hence my, uh, my life in America began <laughs> and uh, met my wife there and uh, we subsequently relocated south and I've been with HCA or a spin-off of HCA now for the last 20 or so years. And you came to this market a couple of years ago. You've been, uh, talk about how big HCA, I don't think people realize how big HCA, in the, in the valley, Carillion obviously has this big footprint, but yeah. I don't think how people know how big HCA, HCA is. Yeah, our parent company based in Nashville. Um, HCA has a corporation over now 250,000 employees across the country, um, 185 acute care hospitals. We have over 250 surgery centers. Um, it, it is uh, the largest healthcare provider in terms of acute care services within America. And we also have six hospitals that are in London, England. So the scale and magnitude of HCA is certainly significant when you look at the business elements of it. What's truly exciting is the clinical aspects. And when we think about patient encounters and we talk about the millions of folks that are treated at an HCA facility, 12 and a half million emergency room visits last year. And when we come to understand what does that mean clinically as to you presented in Denver, Colorado with these signs and symptoms, someone else presented in San Jose, California, Silicon Valley, we're able to use information from those visits and technically understand how now does that influence treatment in the valley. Right. And that sharing is really where scale is so advantageous and it's really exciting. Sharing We've, technology, uh, 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 medical procedures so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Correct. And we've seen the greatest degree of applicability in our cancer programs. Our Sarah Cannon network has allowed us to leverage that with oncology in our market here, both our Salem campus and our Pulaski campus have very, very strong cancer programs. And that sharing of technology, the sharing of drug trials and information, the sharing of research across now a, a, a company that has two, uh, 185 other hospitals is really significant for our physicians taking care of Mrs. Smith. Talk briefly about the Sarah Cannon Institute, mm -hmm. uh, what that actually is, Lance, and, and, and why rebranding it as the Sarah Ca Cannon Institute, I think here and in Pulaski, what that does for you as far as cancer treatment and research. So what that has allowed us to do is, is immediate access into the Sarah Cannon research components, clinical trials, and again, the sharing of information. Sarah Cannon was actually Minnie Pearl. So I, I did not grow up with Minnie Pearl, so this was an education to me. But um, Minnie Pearl had breast cancer, and her belief and passion was that every patient should ac have access to the kind of care that she received when she was in Tennessee. And what she did through the establishment of Sarah Cannon was expand and scale that network. So we are now one, one uh, part of that family with Sarah Cannon. We launched in April. And for our physicians, most importantly, it gives them that access to trials, care, research that they've been able to take from other facilities within the Sarah Cannon network. And one of the things you brought in as a result was is a robotic bronchoscope, bronchoscope which basically allows you what to explore yeah, this tumors. Is, this is incredibly exciting. When we think about technologies and, and how they apply in medicine, in essence, I, I may have um, a CT scan that's done for me through my physician or if I had to turn up to the emergency room for another diagnosis or another uh, pathology. And as a result, if we identify nodules in somebody's lungs, which unfortunately we're in a part of the country where lung cancer is extremely prevalent, mm -hmm. What this does is allow us to navigate, functionally it's a GPS system for the lungs. So rather than having to rely purely on a screen or an x-ray or an image to guide the pulmonologist to that location, he or she is now able to robotically navigate directly to it. So in terms of accuracy, in terms of precision, it ensures that they get the absolute best piece of tissue that can now be analyzed to determine what the treatment path may be. And it could be drugs with a medical oncologist, it could be radiation therapy, or it could ultimately be surgery. Mm. And for those who don't remember Minnie Pearl, 
Grand Ole Opry and also on Hee Haw. Cool. She had the hat with a little price tag on uh, it. So I understand, and right, <laughs> so I've right, seen right. some pictures. Well, Sarah Cannon Institute sounds a little more professional than Mini Pearl it Institute, it but it is Mini Pearl. It before we go away from I just want to, you mentioned to me once before about growing up in New Zealand and what you knew about America. I think you told me you That's learned right. from The Simpsons, and That's was right. it Dallas? At Beverly Hills 90210. Okay, wow. And you so still came here, huh? I still, I did, I still came. It is, <laughs> and, and still here, and, and loving every minute of it. It's been great. Let's talk about some of the uh, recent technology advancements at yeah. Lewis Gale. Well, we talk about this robotic bronchoscope and uh, something else. Uh, the first hospital in Southwest Virginia to perform a robotic esophagectomy. Esophagectomy. Okay. Correct. Well, what Correct. is that all about? Correct. So when we think about our esophagus, we think about our throat and, and how food travels. Um, so again, a, a significant uh, cancer case it involved two of our surgeons, cardiothoracic surgeon and one of our general surgeons, but the robotic removal of a functionally part of your throat and esophagus, uh, esophagus through to the stomach. Um, done robotically with four tiny incisions. Um, historically, this, this is a major cancer surgery where typically folks are opened up. And obviously we know when we have an open surgery, the time and length of recovery um, is delayed, the exposure for, for potential complications is concerned. And so too is drug utilization when we think about pain medications. So if I can reduce the impact of surgery through robotics and technology and, and subsequently have less pain for our patients, mm -hmm. then ultimately your need to have pain medication can be reduced equally as important. When you say robotic surgery, is there nobody wielding a scalpel or is no. it like aiding surgery? It is, uh, it's great clar clarification in regards to that. So you have your surgeon, he or she is navigating the technology to perform the surgery. So they are absolutely there. They're um, not down having a cup of coffee or anything. That's exactly right. Okay. Not, no, no. And I know I saw a demonstration where they were using robotic uh, techniques to, uh, for back surgery to help line up, speci uh, line up using digital mapping how an injection would go into between plates Cor on the spine. Correct. Our spine surgery program, and, and we're very fortunate, our quality outcomes with our spine surgery program have been recognized nationally now for the last four years. But spine surgery has been one where technology has been seen to be extremely advantageous. And again, navigating to the exact point in your back where the disc is a problem, where it might be a nerve outlet or nerve root might be the problem, um, but very, very technical. And you have degrees uh, of one to two millimeters by which you need to ensure accuracy. So mm -hmm. we've, we've enjoyed that technology as well. It, it, uh, Lance, is robotic technology a big thing for Lewis Gale and HCA as a whole? Is it, do you see HCA as sort of being at the, the vanguard of some of that? HCA has really been the leader in robotics. There is no question about it. When we look at um, the, the specifics in terms of general surgery, GYN, certainly thoracic surgeries, um, the, the robotic platform has made tremendous strides. Urology was actually how robotics came to the market um, many, many years ago when, when companies first integrated into it. Hmm. I'm wondering, is it, is it robotic technology? Is it opening up new uh, career paths for people where they have to have certain skills as far as digital mapping or something, or maybe not yeah. even with a medical background? I'm just wondering. So what, what has, uh, uh, there are two elements that really stand out to me, Gene, that have been significant. One is, as a number of our surgeons mature, what robotics has allowed them to do is relax more when they're doing surgery. So where they typically had to stand at the table for two, three, four hours with a lot of um, uh, protective equipment on, typically for radiation, um, that became physically challenging. What robotics allows them to do now is sit down. And so that's allowed a number of them to say, I'll, I'll practice for another four or five, six years, which in terms of their sharing of their knowledge, their intellectual property mm -hmm. is really tremendous for our younger surgeons. What it's done and has been interesting in our younger surgeons, we've really seen that generation that grew up in the gaming arena and Nintendo, right. um, the skill sets that those surgeons have are very intuitive when used on the robotic systems. And that it's in and of itself has been um, an accelerated learning curve that we've watched some surgeons, again, this esophagectomy by young surgeon, um, just phenomenal work, but technically incredibly competent individuals um, that are equally as nice as a person as well. Hmm. I'm wondering how you find, uh, how is recruiting efforts, in, when you recruiting people from outside 
lands through a valley. It's, we're not a major city, yeah. major valley. Uh, is, it a, is it a specific challenge, or do you find like quality of life issues, that type of thing, uh, an asset? I think there are uh, several factors that go into recruitment and, and as we look at recruitment either for a non-physician side or a physician side, it, it really does come down to both the practice opportunity for them as physicians and then secondly quality of life. Mm. What has been interesting is we've now recruited over this last two years 30 new specialists to the Valley. That in and of itself is a significant number no matter where you may be during this COVID time. But what the physicians have come to really appreciate is they have a great lifestyle that they're able to establish here. And if they need a bigger city, they're not far away. So access to Charlotte, access to Raleigh-Durham, you need to get to DC. It's all very commutable for a weekend perspective. But the education system is phenomenal. The equally is important for them and a family. And then obviously the outdoor area is incredibly attractive. And, and this is an undertapped asset, and I'm glad as a region we're taking advantage. Obviously, uh, GoFest in and of itself, a great example of leveraging the outdoors, mm -hmm. but it's a phenomenal part of America to reside in. And you're a runner. You I, had a half marathon recently. You take people out to the Greenway in Salem or just uh, uh, wide open spaces. It is. It is not hard to sell this area to anyone that enjoys the outdoors. And, and a number of our physicians, Interestingly, that we've recently recruited are returning home now um, after being away for training. The boomerang people. The boomerang, that's exactly right. So it's been great to have them returning. What did, I'm just wondering during the COVID, uh, the teeth of the COVID shutdown and all that, what did, did, did a lot of your people who were not in operating rooms or whatever, did they, did they work at home, remote, uh, telehealth, that type of thing, and is some of that remaining in place? Some of our workforce were able to re work remotely. So if we look at some of those um, functions that are not necessarily at the bedside or necessarily clinical, the majority of our clinical staff stayed in place. Mm -hmm. So we were still operating. We still had obviously several hundred folks that were in our hospital every night needing care. That element of the remote components didn't, uh, didn't adjust at all for us. The, the folks that could work at home, the IT professionals, um, accounting, finance, uh, human resources, for example. Um, those folks have now pretty much returned into the facility. I'm wondering if there's anything, not to dwell on COVID, but is there anything that Willis Gale and maybe HCA learn from the whole COVID experience about running smarter, running leaner, running differently, uh, more efficiently in your operation? Anything that's, any lessons coming out of it? I think, if anything, a lesson that really has, I think, resounded for us across the company is just the resilience of our staff and, and what they have dealt with and continue to deal with, how they've managed through it and their, both their patience, their persistence and their tenacity to keep coming back to help Mrs. Smith. Mm -hmm. and, and what they're doing for her and her family in terms of impacting that has been, both, it, it's something that we're very, very proud of. I'm very, very proud of my folks. It, but it sends a very powerful message, I think, to everybody else that healthcare workers really have weathered a lot and continue to. What I think as a company we've really leveraged, again, is the research. When we were early on in the COVID pandemic, the access to medications, the access to testing, um, we had the first testing system with PCR in the Valley and we're able to now not take three or five days and rely on an external company to validate does this person have COVID or not. We were able to have that test perform rapidly and, and obviously rapid testing is commonplace now. Mm -hmm. But what that meant was for our patients in particular was how did we treat them and what was their treatment course and get onto it quickly. It also meant a preservation of personal protective equipment. And that something, as we look at our supply chain system across the company, I think we've become very, very efficient with moving resources around. Mm -hmm. So for example, Florida went through this Delta surge ahead of Virginia. We were able to deploy resources very quickly, for example, ventilators to help our hospitals in Florida of where we have over 50 um, and make sure those folks were taken care of as well. And that's reciprocated for us equally. All right, so in the HCA system, you can move Assets around as needed. Correct. This is a we have an internal FedEx type operation that allows us to deploy that. Not only that, we do it with staff as well. So when we think about major hurricanes, for example, Katrina and the impact in New Orleans, our two lane hospital there, we had staff that were flowing there and, and supported their teams in order to recover. Hmm. Let's talk about some of the th other things going on uh, on your watch. Uh, 
Lance, to talk about the, the midwives program, the midwifery program, yeah. and what that's all about and, and how that's going. It's, it's been a really wonderful addition to the campus. And, and the whole concept of birth and, and new life coming into the world has been exciting. We've obviously seen a, a, an increase in birthing activity um, post-COVID. So, so a number of folks were indoors and we've, right, right. We, we're now seeing the, the fruits of that <laughs> well labor. <said. laughs> That's all right. The midwives and their approach in working with our obstetricians to mom, the degree that she can labor naturally has, has been very, very special. What we have just recently introduced is a new pain management approach. So um, some obviously may need a little more pain management as they're going through the delivery process. We now have nitrous oxide or laughing gas. Um, and, and as folks think about how is my baby protected during the process of delivery, this is another alternative for mums um, if they want some pain medication. Many of our midwife mums may deliver without any medication or intervention, so they use other things. Um, uh, laboring tubs, so you have warm water and you can be in that, different balls, different positions that you can be in the room, but the midwife team have been uh, very, very, um, em very much embraced. Uh, in, in the hospital and they've done really great work with our, our obstetricians. And the difference there is that there are midwives but not in the hospital setting, but by having it in the hospital setting, it's sort of a safety net. That's correct. So um, midwifery often was always thought of, well, I'm at home and I'll manage on my own. And, and that certainly has its place, but there are times when mum may get into trouble or certainly baby may be in trouble. This gives that same experience, but if we need help, we've got it available quickly. And that, that is a differentiator. I mm. um, wanted to talk about uh, the, the, you're going through, a, I guess, a, a, a sleep apnea a treatment option is going to be rolling out. Talk about what that's all about. My dad suffered from sleep apnea, but yeah. what is that all about? It's, uh, listen, it's uh, clearly uh, getting more and more attention nationally in regards to the challenges of sleeping. And frankly, as the reality, none of us probably get as much sleep as we ought I know, to. I know, I don't. So when we look at um, the health ramifications from not sleeping well, they are widespread. And many of our uh, physicians, many of our specialists all need a, an option in regards to treating sleep apnea. And what this technology does, utilized by our ear, nose and throat surgeon, is uh, basically stimulate the tongue such that it doesn't fall to the back of the throat during the night and, and create difficulty with sleeping, hence sleep apnea. Um, great technology, very, very exciting, come out of some major markets across the country and uh, really uh, glad to have that now available here in the Valley for folks. When we think about industry and business, and in particular the trucking industry, obviously the DOT has very strict requirements on truck drivers and time away that they must be stepping down from the cab. Sleep apnea in the trucking industry is a significant problem as well, so excited to support a lot of local employers who fun functionally all rely on trucking as an industry to support them, to help them as well. We only got a couple of minutes left. I want to talk about a couple of things real quick. Uh, how is Lewis Gale helping train tomorrow's physicians? Our graduate medical education program continues to grow. And, and again, we're very fortunate in the Valley, not only with what we have um, in terms of the HCA system, but a number of physicians receiving training here. Across America, HCA is now the largest physician training program in the country. So 5,000 physicians per year are trained across HCA hospitals. We, are, we train currently 125 um, in five key areas. So emergency medicine, internal medicine, family practice, behavioral health psychiatry, and what's known as a transitional year. Uh, that for us is, is clearly the future when we think about physicians and the physician supply. A lot of discussion around the physician shortage. So how do we get ahead of that? HCA has partnered with um, a medical school in Nashville and are very, very proud to be a part of supporting a, a, the, the medical school development moving forward. Equally so in terms of nursing. Right, talk about um, that. You have a relationship with colleges too. Yeah, we, sure, we certainly do. Both local colleges from a nursing perspective, but HCA recently acquired a nursing school as well, Galen University. So Galen will open their first campus in Virginia, in Richmond, in three months. Hmm. And they're currently in the process of exploring other markets, of which we certainly have our hand raised, um, to be a, a location where they would consider having their next program as well. 
well. Mm -hmm. So how do we, again, further support the community with nurse training and education? Equally important. The area schools and what they're doing is truly significant because it's not just nurses or physicians. It's pharmacists, it's scrub techs, it's radiation techs and, and radiologists. It, all of those things really important and glad to have those available in the valley. You can certainly find a job if you need one. You in can in healthcare. We've got about a minute left. Let's talk, uh, Lance, in general about how healthcare and healthcare systems really help drive local economies where they are. It's, it, it will always be an underpinning of a community. When you think about certainly folks that may relocate, you think about a, a strong education system. You think about a safe environment in terms of public service assistance and, and the such like, but you also think about good health care. We employ two and a half thousand people. That represents families with approximately three in each of about 7,500 to 9,000 people, mm. all of them very active and contributing from a tax base perspective, from an economic contribution perspective, very, very strong and very excited to be a part of that. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Lance Jones is market president for Lewis Gale Regional Health System, which is part of the HCA Healthcare Organization. And Lance, thank you very much for joining thank us you. today. Thanks. All right, this is Business Matters. I'm Gene Moreno. Thanks for joining us. If you have any questions or show suggestions, email us at businessmatters at blueridgepbs.org. And if you missed any of our previous episodes, you can watch them on our website at blueridgepbs.org.